Let's do Peter. So we're going to begin with problem two of review one, section two. And here you have two bonds with the same number of years to maturity. And they've given you all this information that includes rates as stated rates. So those need to be converted to be interpreted. And <clears throat> we don't know, uh, we wanna find the coupon rate of the semi-annual bond. They both have um, the same yield to maturity. Okay. So I will, so where did you start? Okay, so to me, I would start by uh, doing the semi-annual coupon rate is divided, divided by two, obviously, since right now is semi-annual on every other other item or for or everything that we need for our values on the problem, they need to be annually because obviously I know that we have the the coupon rate, which is 6.015, you have to divide it by two, and the 2.4, which is per year compounded semi-annually divided by two as well, because we, we just want the maturity of the same number for both bonds one and bond two. So in our formulas, that's good. We're going to take 2.4%. For our formulas. Now this rate, I should clarify, is, hold on, this rate is <clears throat> called, in my notation, EPR one half. You take this one and you divide by two to get 0 0.012. So that's 1.2% a as a yield to maturity for both. Now that I have all the information, um, so everything has to be, because the payments are semi-annual, all the all the information needs to be in, in semi-annual terms, all the variables. So we've converted the yield to maturity. Now we need to, <clears throat> like you said, to get the payment, the payment for bond one is also divided by two times thousand because we know that payment is equal to the coupon rate times a thousand, but it has to be in the interval of the payment. So this is the little c. So we have to divide this by two to get the small c and multiply by a thousand. So we move basically the decimal place over three spots and it is $60.15 is a coupon payment. Let me put it on the same line. No, uh, to, it gave me, uh, oh yeah, you did not, it, that is not the answer, yeah. You Just, okay? So 61.5. So all I did was uh, move the decimal three spots. So it's 61.5, so $60.15. Now, let's uh, write- professor, hmm? My bad, the answer is supposed to be 30.075 for the payment. Oh, I forgot to divide by two. I forgot to divide, two. divide it by two. Yeah, no problem. And then, so it's 30.075, there you go. Because we have to divide by two. Hold on. It equals 30.075, right. So we have all the information now to find the number of years. That's the only thing that's missing, the number of periods, let's be clear. So from the bond one information, we can write up, we have to write up the, the present value is the price. So from bond one, let me make my pen a little thinner. Oh my goodness, I should have used the eraser. All right, so. Okay. 
one one six nine thirty seven equals the annuity piece, which is payments uh oh did i lose connection okay there no okay no we still here we see you i have to i'm just it's just the cable it's back it's coming back all right so the payments are thirty dollars and zero seven five neg I think we're going to keep it at 075, but payments are actually in dollars and cents. Um, but we'll leave it like that because people buy more than one bond. I don't know. So that's, I just usually say do not round intermediate calculations. So we'll, we'll keep it 075 for now. And then the EPR is the 0 0.012 over 1 minus one over 1.012 to the power of the unknown. And then we add the thousand dollars for one plus or 1.012 to the power of T. And so that's what we have to write on the exam, but then you have to say what T is. So you use your calculator and the keys where N is unknown, I by Y is 1.2, the PV is 1,169.37, and the payment is $30 and 0 0.075. And you also have to include the face value or future value. And then you can find T. So did you get that part? Uh, yes, I did. And what was your T? Uh, I'm doing the calculations right now. I, but I believe it's going to be. Make sure that this one is a negative. Yeah. Because you have to imagine purchasing the bond. Uh, and my question is, uh, for I, do we have to change it to multiply by a hundred? Uh -huh, so yeah, you have to for the for the time value of money row, you have to multiply by a hundred. Uh, my N is 9.999, so 10. Okay. So how many, it's just repeating decimal? Yeah, it is a repeat, 9.999052. So it rounds to, depends on the instructions. Um. So so it's it's 9.99, how many nines? Five. My bad. Four, four. My bad. So four nines and then zero five two. Should probably store it. Um, just to make sure you don't round anything. Um, because in the instructions, what do I say at the beginning? I say round it to one decimal place. Final answers, um, interest rates, do I say the final answer must be around? Yeah, in this four, one. Four the... decimal places. Four decimal places, if a percent, six decimal places otherwise. So if we look, um, one, two, three, four. Yeah, so four, it would, would be nine, 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 but it wouldn't be a 10. So, so T is 10, however, that's how many years? What's the question? The question is find the common rate using the information below for the bond, bond two. So let's 
let's um let's do it both ways we'll try it with 10 periods first and was this problem multiple choice no it was solving right you had to solve it yes okay so <clears throat> Let's just do it with 10 first and see how clear the answer is. And then we can check it with this decimal. All right, so now we have the information for bond two. We're gonna use 10 periods and let's write it up for bond two. We don't, we have the price 135608. And then, okay, we want to find payment. And then we're going to use the same yield. And we're going to put it to 10. And then 1,000. And... Uh, and then 10 again. Now do this and solve for PMT. Yeah, the answer gave me 50. $50, nice and round. So yeah, PMT, yeah, $50, Okay. So that's the payment, but you need the rate. Yeah. And to get the rate, you have to use this formula here to find C. And that will be the half year rate. Then you have to multiply by two. You have to do everything backwards than you did here. So if you get 50, then this is equal to C times a thousand. So C So C is equal to zero point zero five zero i guess and wasn't it, wasn't it supposed to be multiplied by two right times two okay so no the thing is that if you're going backwards you go like this and then you have to multiply by two to get the final answer this is this is the um this is the c how do i explain that um the one that you get I use the notation big C, like this is the big C. But the one that you use in the formula has to be like the little C. That's why you have to divide by two to get it into the into the actual, like what you're actually getting paid semi-annually. But we have to present our final answer as a big C. So it's it should actually be um 10 right yeah 10 percent so that's a little c but then um little c is equal to i think that's what i did c is equal to big c over two so 10 percent. so did you get that that's not yeah, the answer yeah, that the answer is seven percent. What I did is multiply two times, and I created a fraction, which is the the C, which is the payment that we, which is payment over future value in time value of money that you showed us that. So what I did is two times create the fraction, which is fifty over a thousand, because obviously I know that we have to multiply by the period, so we wanted to know the the period of we're using, which is semi annually. So that gave me ten percent as well. Okay. So that's it, we're good? Yes. Okay, so basically you have to do what you did up there, but backwards. Okay, so what else? Yeah, and on the same exercise, I wanted to discuss number one, which is on the same paper, just number one. Problem one? Yes. And part two? That's Good. correct.
Okay. All right. So a young couple has made monthly payments of equal size rounding to the nearest cent over the past 10 years on a 25-year mortgage with Banco Popular. The stated rate on the mortgage is... <clears throat> Is seven point two five percent. Hold on a second. I need to get some water. Hold on. <laughs> Don't worry. Don't worry, Professor. Okay, a couple has made monthly payments of equal size over the past 10 years on a 25 year mortgage. <clears throat> I'm sorry, so sensitive. Maybe I need to get a new cable. <clears throat> The stated annual rate on their mortgage is 7.25% compounded semi-annually. They are going to renegotiate their mortgage so they can pay off their loan over the next five years at a lower rate. Okay, so they paid off 10 years. of a 25 year mortgage, where are they in terms of the payments? Currently they're on the 11th year, which is 25 years, they pay 10. So 10 times 12, it will be 120 payments. And obviously we're looking for the next five years. It could be five years or the next 15 years. I know that depending on how much we depending off that they will have complete paid the mortgage on five years it depends on what is the result if they have a short lower rate or so technically they're calculating by the next 15 years or five years So they've already paid off 120 months, right? Yes, they're, they're already paid 120 months. So they're looking at the, the present value of 120 months, right? Yes. The next one would be the 121 payment.
So you have information that the rate, which we need the monthly rate, is um, the stated rate divided by 12. So you'll store this value in your calculator. Or you can times it by 100 and store it. But anyway, it should be stored. <clears throat> so this is going to help you to find out what the balance is. You need to find out how much is the balance at PV 120 months. And the way you're going to find that <clears throat> is uh, you need to know the payment or the C, well, we'll just call it the payment. So this is the monthly. And we we have if one twenty are already paid, then it's one eighty remaining. Yes. So we need to put the payment in there. To no, need okay. So we need the payment, and we need the to be able to find out what the balance is. So we have two unknowns, so we need another equation, unless you know those. You need the other equation. The other equation is they give you information on paying back the loan at the new rate in five years. Okay, so this equation is about finding the balance if you know the current payment. Okay, so my question is, okay, so, okay, so technically the payment will be at 1,200 since they are after careful planning, they calculate that they will need to spend at 1,200 for the, of their monthly income on their mortgage payments to complete pay off the mortgage in five but that, years. That's the next, that's the, that's the, the new payment. This is the old payment. Oh, okay. So we're, we're going backwards. Yeah, I'm just going to write down the two equations and we're going to see what we have and what we don't have. So the, the old payment, knowing the old payment will help us calculate the balance outstanding after okay. 10 years. Mm. But I don't know the balance. <laughs> I don't know the payment. So I need to find them another way. How can I find them? Let's see. Let's put together the other information that we have to see if it helps us. So this is the new payment. So let's make an equation with the new payment. We want to be able to pay off. So we're going to use the same. It's going to be the same PV 120 months. Should pay off with the new payment. Well, we know what it is, so I can just put it in. 1,200. And the new rate, and they gave it to us, right? So it's five. So we're going to get a new EPR. This is the old one. This is the new one. And it's 0 0.05 divided by 12, which is what? Oh, semi-annually. Uh-oh. So this is stated semi-annually. 0 0.025. Oh, no, this is stated semi-annually too. I screwed up. It's not, it's not uh, stated monthly. So that's not correct. So this is actually... 
So this is an extra step. This is really a long question. <laughs> this is because these are stated semi-annually, but you need the monthly. This is not this is not correct. I made a mistake there. So going back, that's the problem here. Nothing else changes. I gotta fix that though. So what what I've been given is the semi-annual rate. And um in US, the rates are uh, monthly, like stated monthly, but in other countries, they're stated semi-annually. So you got to read the fine print. You got to know what, what rate you're facing. So um, what I'm saying is this is an R1 half, which is 7.5%. So we can first find the semi-annual effective rate as 7.5% divided by two and so that's going to be 3.75, right? Yes. But now you, for the mortgage problem, you need the monthly rate. To find the monthly rate, let me erase this stuff here. Erase that and... So the monthly rate, if you're practicing your interest rate conversions, this is going to be, if I do it like this, there are six months in a semi-annual period. So I need to take 1.0375 to the one six minus one to get my monthly rate. And then this is the EPR old. This is the old one. Did I lose connection again? Yes. Touched it. That's all I did. I need a new cable. So plugging that in and storing that number, 1.0375. Three seven five to the power six inverted minus one zero point zero zero six one five four five two four is the rate. So store that in number one. Okay, so I'm currently lost because okay, so <clears throat> they gave us the estimated annual rate on the mortgage, which is two point twenty five. So we divide that by two. To convert it to annually, obviously. Since Sorry, want... they gave me that. They gave me the stated semi-annual rate, which I have to make effective. That's the first step. I can't go from here to here any other way. First, I got to make it effective, and then I do an effective to effective conversion. So when I get a stated rate, I divide by the number of compounding periods. So two, three point seven five percent gives me the effective semi-annual rate. Then I need to convert that to months. And there's six months in a year, so I need to take this rate and partition it into six parts to find the monthly rate. So this is the monthly rate, 0 .0, no, sorry, uh, 0.6154%. So this is an interest rate conversion issue here. Okay. Now... Yeah, so there's there's interest rate conversions issue in this problem. This is a this is a a challenging one. Uh because I well it's it's not hard, but if you read it properly, you can do it and realize there's two you have to do a conversion from quoted to state, sorry, from stated to effective and then effective to effective. You have to do two steps to get this. And then you have to know what uh what the steps are in uh, rene renegotiating your loan. You need to know the balance. And, and then using the balance, and the information given. So for the new one, so this is all the old stuff, right? This is so far what I have on the old stuff. For the new one, I'm told that I'm going to be able to pay off the balance sitting at 120 months by 
paying 1,200 at the new rate, which I have to figure it out. And it's going to be five years or five times 12 is 60. So I wanna be able to pay it off in 60 months. Yeah, that was my question because when I do when I was doing this exercise, I never I didn't understand why we use six, but I understand that it's a piano period, it's just six months. Are you six? It should be sixty. No, on the on the old one. On the old one, when we use <clears throat> my bad, when calculating the EPR. The effective uh, when we calculate the effective annual rate, I know that we use six as uh, one over six because obviously I, I forgot. I thought that was okay. I'm my doing that. I'm doing that because um I made a relationship here that there's I'm using this because I don't go to the EAR. I don't want to do another calculation. So what I do is I just use this one, which is the semi-annual rate, and there are six months in a semi-annual period. So that's why it's a six. Okay. That's why it's a six. Okay. My question will be on the test. Will we will we give it the semi annual uh time or we you I just have to calculate it by just okay compile the semi annually in one period so it will be six months right? Sorry, say it again. Okay, so in a test situation like on Friday, mm -hmm. are we gonna have like a similar problem in which we're gonna have to determine? If we're going to have a two semi annual periods or just one semi annual period? I think your question is Am I going to give you a semi annual mortgage rate? <laughs> I think um, you have to read it. You have to read it and you have to know what you need. This is a very challenging problem here. So uh, maybe like by the end of, by like after the test, you should be com comfortable with something like this, you know, after all your studying. But I understand, yeah, right now. Like I said it before, the whole test is not going to be challenging problems, but I'll put uh, a couple of challenging problems on there. I didn't make the test yet. But it, it shouldn't be all challenging problems. That's not the point. I want a test that you can do the basics too. Most people here, unless they've studied this properly, they will probably assume I meant to say like a, a regular mortgage with a stated stated mortgage rate that's stated um, monthly. It probably would have forgot all this. But now that you know, so if you didn't want to do it this way, you would have to you should you would have to convert this to an effective annual rate and then to there'd be an extra step. I'm just avoiding the extra step. So let put that aside. This is stumping you. You have to review interest rate conversions for this. So let's finish this then. That we have this uh the mortgage rate. We have the mortgage rate. So we have to do the new mortgage rate. So the new mortgage rate is five percent per year. So let's do this again. So R one half is semi-annual as well. So that means that the semi-annual effective rate is divided by two. So it's And now you want to get the monthly rate from there. So you use the equation one plus EPR, the monthly six months make a semi-annual period. So this is um, 
to find it, then you have to use 1.025 to the 1 6 minus 1. And that is the rate that goes in here. So once you find this rate, put it in here. So the steps are for plugging everything in is first you find this. First you find this, I guess. Then you find this. And then you can find this. So first you find the new rate, not the new rate. Wait, we can calculate that. We don't have to find that. What am I saying? I keep on thinking we don't have it, but that would even make it worse. So first, first we find um, this, the principal outstanding. And then once we have that, we can find the payment. And that's it. So this problem was really testing interest rate conversions. Like you had to do so many. One, two, three, four. So do you want to see me do this on the calculator? Yeah. Okay, so for the calculator, then I'm going to start with um, my interest rate conversion to monthly. So it's 1.025 to the power six inverted equals minus one. So this is my new one. So I'm gonna store that in number two. Number one is the old, oops, the old rate. So now putting everything into the time value of money row, 60 periods, I'll recall two times 100. PV is what I wanna find. The payment is one, two, zero, zero. FV is zero, so compute the PV. So this is the balance. So I'm gonna store that in three, but I'm gonna make it a positive first. Oh, I lost it. <laughs> Do it again. Oops. I'm just going to say compute PV, make it a positive and store in three and make a note on your, on your document or on your, uh, on your pages that you stored that in number three. So that is the principle outstanding now for the first part where I'm going to find the payment. I have in here. No, that's not the original. So I got to do this again. So 1.0375 to the six inverted equals minus one. That is the first one. So I have to put in 180 periods. I'm going to recall this times 100, put it into my interest. PV is what I want to find. No, sorry, PV I have. Recall three, put it into PV. Zero into FV, compute, oops, no, compute payment. No, I did something wrong. Do that again. 180 into periods. The interest rate recall one times 100. PV is recall three, zero into FE and compute payment. And that's the payment, 586 and seven cents. Should I do it again from the top? Yes. Okay, so from the beginning, which is really at the end, I'm going to calculate the interest rate for part uh, for the new 
the new account or the new uh, mortgage. So I take 1.025 to the power six inverted equals minus one. And I store that in two. And then I put in the information for the um, the new mortgage. I want to find the principal outstanding that I'm going to be able to pay off with a thousand two hundred dollars. So I'm going to put in um, sixty periods because I want to pay this off in five years. I'm going to recall the rate times a hundred. Put it there. PV is what I want to find. Payment is 1200 and zero is in FV. So I can compute the balance outstanding. So that's the balance outstanding and I'll keep all the decimal places and store that in three, but actually I want to make it a positive stored in three. So then I go back to the first annuity and I put in the values for 180. Make sure you touch everything or else you have to clear TVM. So 180 periods, recall my first interest rate times 100 and put it into interest. Uh, recall number three and put it into PV. Zero into FE and now I can get my payment. 586 and seven cents. So like I said, this is uh, really about interest rate conversions and knowing how to solve a mortgage problem, renegotiating mortgage. And I and I had a, I have practice problems on that already. So this was putting it all together. If you didn't like the way I did the interest rate conversion, like, like I said, you can do it the long way. What the long way means that uh, Professor, my bad for interrupting, interrupting you. When I did the exercise, it gave me uh, 500, uh, 591.21. It not gave me uh, <clears throat> Well, I did it twice. Maybe did you round any of the decimals? You should not round anything. No, I've I never rounded no decimal. Yeah, I don't know what you did. Do it again. I'm going to verify that I got the right answer. All right, two solutions. Okay, so there's a different number even there. Everything looks good. Oh, I see, I see, I see. That's a different part. Okay, there's still, we still haven't finished the problem. We have not finished the problem because you want to know the difference in the payment. Oh, I feel like there's something missing here in the solution. I have the 63. The original mortgage. I do wrong. Fifteen times twelve. I 
Everything looks good. I have five, seven, seven, thirty six. But I got five eighty six. Maybe how would I get that? My numbers look. Oh, what did I do wrong? Original mortgage rate seven point two five point oh three six. Maybe I did something wrong there. <clears throat> I use 7.5. What does it say here? 7.25. Well, that's my mistake. That is my mistake. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. My mistake goes all the way back here. I use 7.5 rather than 7.25. So... Uh, I have to do, I guess, just this last part again. So it's, yeah, 7.25, not 7.5. So 7.25 divided by 2 converted is 3.625. So everything was good until the end that I had the wrong. So this is what I mean about people sharing their work. If they did most of the problem, but they did something like that, they shouldn't get zero, you know? <laughs> it's like, that is like a transcription error that shouldn't show that you don't know. You know what I mean? You should get an opportunity there to get some points. Um, so three, six, two, five. And so if I take that... Um, so now I'm going to take 1.03625 to the 6 inverted equals minus 1. This is like 5%. Yeah, I, re I already did the answer and it gave me one point uh, for that. It's 0 0.00595238.34. And I multiplied that times 100, and it gave me 577. When I did the full time value of money, it gave me 577.37. Yeah, I have a wrong number here again. One more time. One more time. One point oh three six two five to the power six minus one. Now I get that number that you just said zero zero five nine five two three eight three store one. And so doing this again, I still have in my memory three. No, I lost it. I lost it. I don't know why. How did I lose it? Oh, because it's over here. All right, so I'm going to do that calculation in the calculator, 1.03625. So 1.03625 to the power of 6 inverted equals minus 1 and store in 1. Okay, so now I'm going to recall 3, and that's all there still. So for the second formula, 
for the top one. N is 180. Interest is um, the recall two times 100. So recall one. Recall one times 100. And PV is recall three and zero into FE. And now I get the payment 57736. All right, so 57736. So now that's a payment, you round that. That's the final answer. So payment is equal to 57736. And the question asked, by how much have they increased their payment? So the payment originally, uh, sorry, their pay, payment originally was this number, 57736, and now it's 1,200. So you just calculate the difference. Okay, all right, so are there any other problems? Okay, let me check real quick. Yeah, on the <clears throat> on the same paper, yeah, on the same paper. Well, let me do a different one. Yeah, I think. Yeah, Jeez. yeah, I uh, test prep questions. Yeah, on the test prep, uh, I have some doubts when I started calculating the effective annual rate of fifteen percent. That is the <clears throat> the test prep question. Yeah, the first one. Yeah. So which one would you like to look at? On the test prep, I wanted the I want the first problem. The whole thing? Uh <clears throat> just when it says annual rate compounded continuously and compounded every decade. Okay. Yeah, I'll just take the questions out as we go.
the effective annual interest is 15%, then find the, oh, you wanted the other thing. You wanted the. The continuously and every decade. Okay. No, that's not it. This one? Yes. And this one. Yes. Okay. So remember, I explained the string of effective rates that you can start with an effective annual rate and it's equivalent to taking an effective semi-annual rate for two periods. If you accumulate them, you get the effective annual rate. But then you can even think of smaller uh, periods of time. So what about quarters? So you could take um, the quarterly rate four times, and that also should be equivalent to a year, right? And then you should be able to take the monthly rate 12 times, and that should also, if you accumulate it um, for every dollar, that should also be equal to a year. And then I said daily, you should be able to take 365 accumulation factors. And that should also make a year. So we're getting smaller and smaller, but we have to accumulate more and more, right? To cover a year. So continuous compounding, a rate that compounds continuously is the smallest that you can get. Now, let me go somewhere else for before I go right to that and remind you that we also learned that if you're given a stated rate, you need to divide it by the number of compounding periods to convert it into its effective equivalent rate, correct? So we take a stated rate, divide it by two, uh, sorry, um, a semi-annually stated rate, we have to divide it by two to make it an effective semi-annual rate, and then we can make this equivalency. So I can repeat all these formula, but with stated rates, if I was given a stated rate, I can convert it. So you, you know this, right? If I take the semi, uh, the monthly stated rate divided by 12, it'll be the effective monthly rate. So these are the string of equalities for effective and even stated rates. So compounding continuously actually fits at the beginning. Trying to clean that up. So at the very beginning of this string of equalities, imagine having a rate 
with a subscript, I would have to divide it just like each of these. Oh, I forgot to, I forgot to do this one. This one would be R, the stated daily rate, like on your credit card. So you have to divide by 365 to get the effective daily rate. So using the same pattern, if I was to make it as small as possible, it would be instantaneous compounding interval. Then I would have to divide it by the number of compounding periods in a year. And it's always the inverse. It's always the inverse number. So that's why I write it one over N. And then I put that number there. So that's the pattern, right? N and N, this is one over N. And what I'm gonna do is make that interval as small as possible. And the only way I can understand that is using a limit function. If you remember from quantitative methods courses, and I want to send this in to zero. If I send n to zero, this becomes zero, this becomes infinity, that becomes infinity, which is actually something you should have learned in quantitative methods. If you didn't, I'm telling you now, if you didn't say calculus, you would have learned it there. This is actually equivalent to the exponential function with the exponent being called the continuously compounded rate. So we interpret it as the annual rate compounded continuously. So it fits right here. Now I'm never gonna ask you to write that out or anything, but I just want you to understand why it sits there. Notice it's not one plus, okay? E, -R e to the power R zero is equal to one plus E A R, but it's not one plus R zero, like all of these are one plus, one plus, one plus. So from there, I have the equivalency that I want to use. I want to use this and this. I want to say ER zero is equal to one plus EAR. They gave me, this is 15%. So I can find R zero using mathematics. I take the log of both sides. And when I take the log of both sides, the natural log cancels with the exponential function and I get this. So then the they cancel and I get R0 as a constant log 1.15 and that's all I plug in to find in my calculator. Where, where, did I lose you anywhere there? Where did I lose you if I lost you? Uh, <clears throat> okay, so you said that on the test, you're not gonna put the equation, just plug it into the calculator, right? I, I said, I'm not gonna give ask you anything about this limit function, but I just showed you now that it follows the same pattern for smaller and smaller intervals of compounding so that you know that's why it fits here. This is the same function as this. So um, that's how you can solve it. So you match this one plus EAR with ER zero and solve. So to put this in your calculator, it's 1.15 and then uh, long LN. I don't know if you have to do second function. Uh, mm. On this yeah. exercise, I'm using a TI-84. So I just do second function. It gave me e to the exponent, and I just put 1.15. And what do you got? Uh, yeah, I get... Yeah, when I said compounded continuously, it gave me 
3.15 and the answer is 13.97. So yeah, I did something wrong. Okay, I have the answer now. Good. Yeah, yeah, give me the answer. Mm. So the other one you wanted was decades. All right, so this one goes on the other side. So in other words, I can have longer intervals for compounding, but I can still relate them to a year. So if I had an effective rate that compounds only every two years, I would write it like this. Remembering the subscript is always in fractions of a year. Well, if it's two years, you have to make it two. But then to, to get it back to equivalency of a year, because this is exponential, I have to put it to the power one half. So this is the effective rate, touch it again, the effective rate So this is the effective two-year rate. What about 10 years? How should it look? Should be 10 years. And then to get back to the year, you have to partition it into 10 parts in the exponent. So that now that's a year. So if you just work with the patterns, you're gonna be okay. So the question asks you to find annual rate compounded every decade. So they don't want the effective rate, they want the stated rate. So what you have to find in the end is one plus R 10 um, What is the relationship between R10 and EPR10, I think, before I write that down. What is the relationship between R10 and EPR10? 
This one is just simple interest, right? And it's giving the simple interest in terms of a year because it's the annual rate compounded every decade. So rather than um, multiplying, what am I doing? I'm dividing. So the rule was always R I'll do it like this. Think back to the daily rate. When we had the daily rate from my credit card, 365, I had to take it and divide by 365 to get the effective daily rate. But that's because this was stated over a year and I had to divide it to get it to the equivalent daily rate, not equivalent, but the simple interest daily rate. In other words, in other words, 365 times the daily rate made the stated daily rate. So what we have now is a situation where the rate is not in fractions of years, it's in years. So this is for 10 years. So I think it will work better if I remind you of the timeline. So like, So for every day you pay daily interest for a total of 365 days. Right? And we know that to calculate the effective annual rate, we have to do this effective daily rate for 365 periods of compounding, right? And that should be equal to one plus EAR. But, the stated daily rate doesn't care about compounding. It just cares about simple interest. So all it does is it takes the daily effective rate and multiplies by 365. And it's like a way to say things over the year it's like rounding it up to over the year, but and representing the year because that's what R does, but it ignores the interest on the interest. Now this R should also be stated in terms of a year. So it takes the 10 year effective rate and it has to divide it into 10 to turn it into a year. So this converts it into a year. which is what the stated rate wants, the R. So the question was, find the equivalent annual rate compounded every decade. You need to find the effective 10 year rate and divide by 10. And how are you gonna find that? Well, you just have to compound 15% for 10 years and divide by 10. So to extend this set of formulas, then I would have to write ER2, oh, sorry, 
This would actually be two times R2 to the one half. And this would be one plus 10 times R10 to the one ten. So if you get, again, get used to the pattern and you won't have trouble. <laughs> But it's all in terms of a year. So that converts those rates into an annual rate. And every time notice that two, so because this is in terms of a year, I have to multiply it by two to get the effective rate over two years. Confusing, right? Let's see. Um, uh, are you there still? I'm going to see if I gave you. No, I don't think I gave you my other map. Yeah, I'm still here, Professor. <clears throat> so I only gave you up to there. I should give you guys the other conversion map that I made. One second. <clears throat> well, anyway, I gave it to you. I gave it to you now, but that's basically all I have on my other page. It's the same thing that I just wrote for you. Any questions? So to find this answer, you have to take So R10 is equal to one tenth of EPR10. So again, it's it doesn't care about the interest on the interest. It's just this is more than a year, so you have to divide it by ten. And um, to get EPR10, you have to do uh, one point one five to the ten. I should not bother with the brackets. 1.15 to the 10 minus 1. And then take the answer and divide by 10. Okay, now I understand, Professor. Yeah, that's good. I'll put this other map up with the extra sides, like the log. I think I did give you that in the log one, right? Let me see. I, I gave it in the continuous compounding, did I? Nope. Did I give it in the solutions? No. Okay, so I'll put that extra form up that extends both ways. This way and this way. 
Okay, what else? Okay, I would like to do... Okay, so... And number 20 on the test prep question. Twenty. Yes. Okay. Winkler's first quarterly dividend is expected to be three years from today with an expected amount of $1.20 per share. Each subsequent quarterly dividend is expected to grow by 2.5%. Following the quarterly dividend seven years from now, the quarterly dividends are expected to grow by 2% each quarter. Given the risk associated with Winkler's stock, the required expected return is 18% per year effective. What is the price of one share of Winkler's stock? All right, so payments are quarterly. I need a quarterly rate. Let me draw first what we have. with an expected amount of $1.20 per share. Each subsequent quarterly dividend is expected to grow by 2.5%. Following the quarterly dividend seven years from now, Okay, so three, four, five, six, seven. The quarterly dividends are expected to grow by 2% per quarter. I'm putting a little quarter there so you remember those are the quarterly rates. All right. Okay, so payments are quarterly. So we need the quarterly rate. We're told the effective annual rate it's 18%. And we know that 
the relationship between quarterly rates and effective annual rate is that for accumulations of the quarterly rate, make a year. So I can find the quarterly rate by partitioning in the exponents into four fractions or four parts. So that's the quarterly rate. Now in terms of the valuation, the formulas that I have for valuation work where the valuation is one period from today and then growth kicks in. So we have that happening here. That means I have to be able to value the security one quarter before. So the value should be here for this amount that I'm gonna make it, I could have made this bigger, it would have helped. So a dollar twenty here, the valuation will be here. PV and it's one quarter before. So we could call it um in terms of quarters. The 120 would, would be at time uh, three times four is 12, right? 12 quarters. So this would be at 11 quarters. Mm, let me make my years in blue. So I'll call it 11 quarters. And so that way I have one period from now is the first payment. And then the next one begins to grow. Now it only, it has a limited amount of growth. How many periods of growth are there from from here. In other words, I want to know the exponent. I need to know the exponent by the end, before the seventh year. So all the way to here, I need to know what the payment would be on the seventh year, where there will be one, two, three, four payments, one, two, three, four payments, one, two, three, four payments. What is the, the payment here? I'll call it at time seven times. So this was three times four to get 12, right? So I'm going to do seven times four from perspective of today, just for the counting. Seven times four is 28. So I want to know what is the payment at C28. How are you going to figure that out? So you want to figure out the number of periods of growth between P12, or this is, this is, I mean, I don't know my subscripts are so good. I should just say payment at quarter 28 because because it isn't the 28th payment. So how do we figure that out? I mean, you could count it. 
But what's a more efficient way? I mean, we can just count it, right? So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So there should be a growth factor of 16. Do you agree? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And I need that because that's going to help me get the next one. And so these cash flows in here, there's going to be there's going to be how many? 17 payments? Yeah, 17 payments. So there's 17 payments starting with a dollar 20 and that's a 20 period annuity. Then the la the remainder is a growing perpetuity. Sorry, I said that again. It's a 17 payment growing annuity. And then it's a growing perpetuity. Those are the two parts and you need the first cash flow. That's why I have to get the last one of the annuity so I can get the first one of the perpetuity. So I will put this one here. And then to get the, the next one. It will be a dollar twenty, sixteen of the first rate, and then one of the new rate, and that will be the first payment. So all you need to solve this are one twenty. So everything that I have in red is all you need. You need the first payment for this and you need the first payment for this part with the perpetuity. The problem is then that you have to discount each part. So let me erase this so I can... So it's going to be this one here, and then you're gonna have one here that's PV28. The reason I'm doing that is then I know how to discount back to zero. So this one will be discounted 11 quarters and this one 28 quarters. I run out of space. Are you following? So I'm going to ask you to try not looking at the answer. Just try and write that up for yourself with the information I've given you. See how well you do. Oh, 
Okay, so I have to calculate the payment for the first quarter for the quarter for the twelve quarter number twelve, and then the payment for quarter number twenty eight, right? Well, you know the payment for the twelve, it's one twenty. Yeah. And then you need to get the payment for the for the twenty ninth. Is this one? But you don't have to even calculate that. What you need, what I want you to do is make a formula with all this information. So the first part is going to be the dollar twenty. This will be at PV eleven, and it's an annuity, growing annuity. So you have to put EPR one quarter minus the G 0 0.025 and then one over one plus G 1.025 divided by one plus EPR. One quarter and that's going to be, we said, uh, what did we say? 17? Yeah. payments 17 payments and 16 periods of growth and then oh sorry I did that wrong I did that wrong this is a plus and then because it's a growing this has to be up for both of them I just got to put it like this like that and then you need to discount this back to time zero to value for prospective investors. And you have to do the same for this. That's the first part. I'm just putting it all down and then you can try and punch it in. So the tough part was drawing the timeline and counting all the parts. I mean, I wanna see if I got this right in the end too. So now the second part is a perpetuity that's growing. Um, and so you just gotta put the first cash flow, which is the dollar twenty, one point oh two five, and one point oh two and I minus G. So I is still the whatever we find as the quarterly rate and then G is 0 0.02. And when we're done finding that we have to, so maybe we can just put this whole thing um, you know, because it's different because this one needs to be discounted 11 quarters and the other one needs to be discounted 28 quarters. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's it. So I've, are there any questions about that? I gotta check if it's right. No, this is okay. So my question is okay for the third period. For the three periods, we just set up the annuity, but we have to be discounted. So we did one over one plus EP uh, EPR one quarter, uh, uh, to the power of eleven, right? Just for the discounted period, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Let me see the, the answer. Which one is this again? Uh, 20. So what did I write here? 
11, see, 11, 28. This is the first one with I minus G. And then one plus G over one plus I, and I said 17. And then here, yeah, it's the same. So it should work. It should work. Again, these are practice that stretches your mind, right? I won't give you something this complicated on a test, but it's not hard. I mean, you can do it. It just can be complicated and you can go wrong so many places. By the yeah, end of the it's... course, you should be able to do something like this with no problems. Yeah, because uh, I know that for, for a fact, it is just uh, for only the three, the three years and to it being discounted, it will be, you know, easier obviously because since we know we just for the quarters of three years and it's discounted so it's not that hard but when you add the perpetuity it makes this a little bit harder and i know that for a fact that when you discount it it is more challenging then mm -hmm. so yeah <clears throat> so practice you know those trying to write those up that that's the answer. Okay. But how do you put do you put uh, everything in the calculator by time value of money or did you just enter it manually and the answer? Oh manual? no, you have to make it all annual. You have to do it manual because this one is not a function in the calculator. The growing annuity you have to punch in yourself. Okay. And the growing, all the growing, the growing perpetu perpetuities, you have to calculate yourself as well. So you got to be, you have to practice punching that in. So take a, take a screenshot anyway of that and see if you can get the answer. You have the answer. You just don't have the formula. <clears throat> okay. So after this test, I'll put up the solution so you can start studying, you know, what you did wrong or whatever. But, um... Right now, I mean, nobody else asked for clarification, but uh, you have this now. Thank you, Professor, a lot. Okay, I hope it helps. Yeah, I've been meaning to ask you. Uh, <clears throat> I know that you told me that you gave me two possible solutions for the test already. I, to, today, I couldn't cancel <clears throat> my appointment. Mm -hmm. um, I 